The old man suddenly stepped on an oil slick and slipped. He fell onto the tram tracks. In the next moment, the tram came roaring towards him. He quickly tried to get up, but was caught by the tram. In the end, his head was twisted off. Just a few minutes ago, a German man had told him, you're about to lose your head. Russian fantasy blockbuster, the devil descends on earth, a talking strange cat, and humans who can fly by applying cream. A world woven with reality and fantasy is about to unfold. In a late night in Moscow, the building manager discovered that the door in the lobby was suddenly opening itself, and the mailboxes were making noise, as if there was an invisible person moving around. Moreover, she even took the elevator up to the upper floors. She couldn't open Mr. Latushkin's door, so she climbed in through the window. An invisible person turned on the tap. She opened a drawer and found a hammer, and started damaging Mr. Latushkin's house even throwing ornaments down to the floor below. The invisible person was breathing angrily, and the sink began to flow with water. When the owner returned home, he saw that the curtains seemed to be moved by someone. The invisible person entered a small boy's room. In the mirror reflected her beautiful face. It turned out that the scene just now was only a novel created by a writer. This writer is even locked up in a mental asylum. He seized the opportunity when the nurse came to give an injection and took the keys. When night fell and all was quiet, the writer opened the iron door and went to the balcony. Unexpectedly, there was a prisoner wearing a hat, moving freely on the balcony. He even sneaked into the adjacent cell and released the person bound to the bed. The writer peeked through the window and from the conversation between the two inside, it was revealed that the person wearing the hat is the master. The prisoner he saved is named Ivan. He makes a living by writing poetry. Ivan asked the master why he was locked up in the mental asylum. The master explained that a year ago, he wrote a novel about Pontius Pilate, which was deemed by the outside world as a subversive work praising Christ. So the master gave up everything, including his name, came alone to the mental asylum. A year ago, the master was highly esteemed and his play pilot was in rehearsal. A group of people suddenly rushed in and dismantled the set. They said that the play was ordered to be cancelled by the National Academy of Sciences. The master wanted to know the reason for the cancellation. The theater manager, Cozy, he is currently on a business trip. The financial manager instructed him to go to apartment 50 on Sesovalea Street. Upon hearing this, the master immediately went to this location. The girl who opened the door indicated that Mr. Cozy was not present, but the sound of his drunken shouts could be heard from inside the house. She hastily closed the door, not wanting to let the master disturb what was inside. As he was about to leave, he unexpectedly met the editor. He comforted the master upon learning that pilot had been cancelled, saying there was no need to worry. If a performance is cancelled, everyone will read the original work, trying to uncover the reason for its prohibition. It's also a good thing. They went to the writers' union, where discussions on the artistic and political elements of pilot were to take place today. The master sat on a chair to the right, much like a prisoner, listening to the critics' judgments one by one. Surprisingly, the first person to take the stage was Latushkin, the character in the novel written by that writer. He stated that the party and government are working hard to rid this country of reactionary and religious prejudices. However, as a member of the Soviet Writers' Union, the master wrote a novel defending religious obscurantism. Latushkin's accusations are very serious. One accusation after another landing on the master's head. The editor saw that the situation was spiraling out of control made a statement, announcing the cessation of the publication of Pilot. The master was deeply disappointed by this turn of events, seeing literature turned into a weapon of the Union, which he viewed as the greatest insult to his work. However, his friends believed that the master should not lose heart, as the more he is struck down, the more he should rise up. Friend Ali led the master to attend the writer's union party that night. An actress linked her arm with the masters as they entered, and Ali pulled him aside, saying that Tomorrow at 10 in the morning in front of the union building, there would be a protest against the censorship system, and he hoped the master would join. Distant noise caught their attention. The master recognized that it was the theater manager. He wanted to go talk to him, but a waiter came over to escort the master outside, saying that from that day on, the union would no longer entertain him. This was truly going too far. The master was about to light a cigarette to ease his worries, when a mysterious man with glasses suddenly approached. Surprisingly, the two of them hit it off quite well. As the man with glasses left, he also left behind a business card, 
with Prof. de Volland written on it. At that time, the master was unaware that this foreign visitor to Moscow was actually the demon Volland. He visited the mortal realm in order to observe humanity. The next day, the master and Ali met at the Union entrance, but no writers came to protest. Everyone was participating in a genuine national parade. The master was squeezed in the crowd. Feeling out of place among the fervent crowd, he was about to break into the procession, when a woman pulled him back. She was Margarita. The master saw a sense of loneliness in women's eyes. They hit it off immediately, and in the days that followed, they went out together. They strolled along the streets of Moscow, hand in hand through Alexander Garden, and then to Patriarch's Pond to enjoy the view. Ivan's expression changed when he heard this. He lowered his voice and told the master, I was right next to Patriarch's Pond and encountered a person who was like Satan. At that time, Ivan was chatting with the editor Berlioz. Bikas Berlioz had commissioned him to write an anti-religious epic poem. The two of them were sitting on a bench chatting when Professor Woland appeared. Berlioz did not deny it. Because he was a staunch atheist, Woland countered the two. If God does not exist, who established the order of this universe? I can prove that. There is a god in this world. Wolin smiled as he told Berlioz, Tonight, you will die, and your head will be cut off completely. At that moment, Berlioz and Ivan considered him to be just a madman. Due to an inner unease, Berlioz left with his briefcase, but slipped and fell. He ended up lying on the tram tracks, and soon a tram approached. Berlioz scrambled to avoid it, but due to not being fast enough, his head was decapitated by the tram. His head bounced far away and it was only found by the police after dark. After hearing the screams, Ivan rushed to the scene to see what had happened first. Ivan heard that Berlioz's head was missing. He realized that it was Wolin's doing, but he had no evidence and couldn't convince the police at all. Ivan had no choice but to chase after Wolin himself, a person suddenly disappearing, leaving only a black cat in front, with passersby making faces at Ivan, as if the whole world was playing tricks on him. Ivan was being toyed with by the devil. Finally, he intruded into the writer's union territory. He claimed that a German had killed Berlioz, but those present saw him as insane and incoherent, so they tried to stop Ivan from approaching. Unexpectedly, the other party actually started to move, and it took several security guards to intervene and apprehend Ivan. He was later locked up in a mental institution. After the writer listened to this story, he continued to go back and write. From this, it can be inferred that the conversation between Ivan and the master just now, this might also be a part of the writer's book. They intertwine with each other in the realms of fantasy and reality, with a novel within a novel, where the authenticity of the characters is hard to discern. On the side of the master and Margarita, just as he was trying to bring them closer. However, Margitat said that she was already married. Fortunately, this did not lead to a break in their relationship. On that day, Margitat came to visit the master, wanting to borrow the new novel he was working on. This manuscript was titled The Black Magician. The protagonist's name was also Woland. Just then, the master received a sudden phone call, summoning him to the theater. Margitat decided to accompany him for part of the journey. On the way, the master spoke about the outline for the next chapter of his new work. This story was dedicated to the theater manager, Codette. The story began in the apartment where he lived. One day, Codette woke up from a hangover, struggling to sit up and drink water, only to see Wolin's reflection in the bucket. Codette looked up, seeing the figure seated across from him. He wasn't surprised, as Codette knew Wolin's true identity and had signed a contract with him for seven performances. Wolin brought along a peculiar pet cat, a young maid, and two henchmen. They took over Codette's apartment. Wolin instructed his subordinates to throw Codette into a mental hospital. Margaret quipped, at least, Codette's ending is much better than Berlioz losing his head. As the master got to this point, they had already arrived at the theater entrance. Several employees were taking down posters for Pilot. The master had thought that this visit was definitely about restarting Pilot. It seemed like that. This play had been completely canceled. The theater had called him over just to settle his salary for the first half of the year. Feeling down, the master went to have dinner with Margaret with a bottle of wine. The two danced to the music from a record player. The master felt that Margaret was like an angel. But Margaret said, I'm more suited to be a witch than an angel. The feelings between the two finally broke free. They took the final step. The master wanted to write Margaret into his novel. 
Писатель, который пишет роман про Понтия Пилат. Although they truly loved each other, but they couldn't change the fact that Margaret had a husband. They could only meet in the mornings. Margaret was like the master's secret wife, always wearing an apron to make breakfast. Even the hat was handmade by Margaret. She admired the master's talent and loved the novels he wrote. No one knew about their clandestine love affair. Not long after, Margaret saw the critic criticizing the master. She was very angry about it. She picked up a hammer and went out. The master wanted to go and stop her. He opened the door and came face to face with Alexei. Alexei smiled, having guessed the relationship between the two. However, Alexei's visit this time was to check on the progress of the novel. The master still retained the character of Pontius Pilate, who is a figure from the Bible, responsible for sentencing Joshua to death, leading to Joshua being crucified. He was originally a cruel governor. He seemingly devoid of humanity, yet with some remnants of goodness in his heart. After conversing with Joshua, he understood the goodness in people's hearts. But due to cowardice in the face of power, Pilate did not save Joshua, leading to his millennia of regret. Ali understood this content was not just about ancient Judea, but was meant to reflect that everything happening in Moscow. However, Alexei cautioned the master not to show this book to anyone else, as it could lead to serious trouble. Shortly after. The theater's new play premiered, which was the new script written by Ali. The master and Vorland agreed to watch it together. This story was indeed different from Pilot, with the actors singing and dancing in praise of the homeland. Absolutely no one would stand up to stop this kind of play. However, Vorland soon couldn't sit still, causing chaos in the theater with his pet followers. The actors scattered in fear. Vorland sat at the highest point of the stage, announcing that he was about to perform a dark magic show. His assistant rolled a spherical prop onto the audience seats, then pulled out two pistols and shattered it. A flood of banknotes spilled out from the broken ball. The audience scrambled to pick up the money. Only one actor remained on stage, trying to wake the audience up, saying that black magic didn't exist in the world. However, as everyone filled their pockets with cash, they wouldn't let anyone ruin such a good thing. <laughs> The magic assistant found the proposal interesting, and they sent out the black cat. They cut off the actor's head, leaving the remaining half of the body, immediately begging for mercy on its knees, hoping that Vorland would spare him. The sorcerer ordered his minions to put the head back on. The theater manager quickly escorted the actor away. Following that, the second magic act began, transforming the stage into a fashion runway where beautiful ladies in various dresses made their entrance. The assistant encouraged the female audience to eagerly raise their hands, tempting a short-haired woman who couldn't resist. She willingly stepped onto the stage. She was locked in a small room. In an instant, she was dressed in magnificent attire. Soon, more and more women took the stage. Even some men squeezed in to dress up. The assistant announced that everyone could take any items from the display cabinets. The audience all rushed onto the stage, behaving like devolved apes abandoning civilization. The sorcerer quickly ended this farce, and the theater returned to its original state. No one remembered what had just happened. Fortunately, the master had the fortune to witness the entire event, where the darker side of humanity was laid bare before him. The two then left the theater, only to come across Margaret and her husband. The next day during their meeting, the master deliberately brought up the play from the previous night, wanting Margaret to know that he had been at the theater as well. To lighten the mood, Margaret invited the master for a picnic outside. Margaret encountered their maid Natasha at home. She hinted to the other party not to speak out of turn, but Margaret grew tired of hiding. She wanted to come clean with her current husband. The master didn't want to ruin Margaret, not willing for her to perish along with him. Yet Margaret had made up her mind, asking the master to wait for her. At the airport the next morning, in the evening, footsteps could be heard outside. One silhouette after another flitting past the windows. The master knew that they had come for his new novel. If discovered by the Union, he would surely face judgment. In the end, the master made a firm decision. He stuffed the manuscript into the fireplace. The next morning, Margaret didn't wait for the master to show up. And when she ran to his house to check, the master had already been taken away by the Union. Round after round of questioning ensued, and his literature was deemed harmful literature and anti-Soviet propaganda. Even though the master burned the manuscript, he couldn't escape judgment. The master mentioned that this book was created at the invitation of Professor Voland. However, the Union stated that there was no individual by the name of Voland. The inevitable outcome can be imagined. 
as the master was swiftly locked away in a mental institution, his symptoms being an inability to distinguish between fiction and reality. He believed that the characters in his book were real. After the master was confined, he didn't cease creating, being both the author and the master within the book. During the day, he underwent electroshock therapy and wrote clandestinely at night, all because the master had promised Margaret that he would provide an ending to this story. Now, to this day, he has finally completed his work. The master handed the manuscript to a nurse, instructing her that if one day, a woman inquired about him here, she should pass this manuscript on to her. As for Margaret, she still went to the basement to find the master, but the owner of the house had become Ali, the one who reported the master to the union, because apart from Margaret and Volant, only Ali had seen that manuscript. Margaret coerced Alex into revealing the whereabouts of the master. The next morning, she arrived at the asylum, where the director stated that the patients here did not receive visitors, and ordered his staff to chase Margaret away. The nurse followed quietly, handing her the manuscript, and also explaining that the master had passed away the previous midnight. The master was already dead. That evening, Margaret read through the complete manuscript. In the story, she truly became a witch. On the night of the full moon, Margaret shed all her clothes, applying a bomb to her body, and rose into the air, becoming invisible. Margaret flew over Moscow, heading to the house of Latunsky, seeking revenge on this critic who defamed the master. Ultimately, Margaret joined Volan's camp, receiving a lineup of various characters' greetings. Some were poisoners, executioners, madams, jailers, swindlers, everyone had to kiss Margaret's left leg. In a coronation ritual for her, faces in chaos, almost bursting Margaret's mind, even her knees swelled abnormally. Fortunately, Margaret passed the devil's test, and Volant promised to grant her one wish. I want to return my master. And to make everything as it was. Just as she finished speaking, the master appeared before her, but soon a group of soldiers caught up. However, when they broke in, only the large black cat remained inside, playing with several soldiers. It even deliberately started a large fire. Volan looked at the vanishing city, finally losing interest in observing humans. He bid farewell to the master and Margaret, then disappeared into the air. Margaret, after finishing the manuscript, fell into an eternal slumber. The film is adapted from the novel by Russian writer Bulbakov of the same name. The film consists of three main storylines, the devil Voland visiting Moscow and observing the society of Moscow, the love story of the master and Margaret, and the thousand-year regret of Pontius Pilate. Reality and fantasy blend together, coupled with innovative storytelling techniques and structure. The chaotic pace is just an illusion, actually forming the most perfect and harmonious loop. However, the film and TV adaptation really can't keep up with the pace, leaving those unfamiliar with the original work feeling disjointed. When watching for the first time, they will definitely feel that the plot connections are not smooth. If you enjoy my channel, please give me a subscription.